wanted to welcome everybody here for our town hall. Um, we wanted to go ahead and start this out with a just a very simple, practical uh, 10 to seven minute meditation here. I mean, I'm sorry, five to seven minute meditation. Three to five minutes. Three to Jesus five minutes. Christ. You know, I'm always pushing for longer. <laughs> you know, so actually the whole thing, we're going to do 45 minutes of silence. I'm kidding. All right, so let's, uh, let's just go ahead and start. Most of this will be guided. So let's just simply find the body that we're in today at this moment. And let's just recognize that we're actually in a body. So we start to cultivate the awareness that tends to be out in front of ourselves during our busy, busy lives, but we kind of loop that awareness back into this container, into this body that we've been graciously given. And we just allow this sense of awareness to kind of flush through this body naturally, kind of a nice broad stroke of awareness flushing through the body, maybe from the top of the head down around the backs of the eyes and around the ears, relaxing the jaw and the palate Letting the shoulders relax down through the torso, the tummy soft. And we recognize the sit bones down in our cushion or on the ground. And down through the legs and the feet planted on the ground themselves. And then we flush back up through the body with this awareness. And we start to see what else we can utilize, what else can we tap into as we just simply sit to kind of drive home a little more deeply this awareness. And one of the things we can start to become aware of is the weight and the density of this body, the heaviness of this body We start to experience this relationship by recognizing the ground beneath us. We feel our bodies planted down on the ground. We feel the weight of the body kind of imprinting down on the ground. And we take it a little further and we start to see that the ground is actually the earth itself. The earth itself doing what she does so well supporting us, always lending herself to us to ground down into whenever we need, whenever we need it. And we look at this a little more deeply and we see that the earth is really always providing for us and really giving us everything we need to keep ourselves sustained while we're here. The air we breathe and the water we drink and the food we eat. And all of this for the most part given freely, given to us freely. And especially at times like that we're going through right now, these times of a, a very heightened sense of uncertainty, it's important to see how well we are being taken care of and how the earth just, just really does this naturally on our own. And I think if the earth would ask anything of us, especially during a time like this, it would just simply be for us to be awake and to be aware and start to 
engage in this life and engage in this world from the heart instead of maybe this conditioned mind. And lastly, we start to recognize the breath. This phenomena that just kind of happens without us thinking about it. This process that just happens naturally. This exchange between the inner workings of our body and the world out in front of us, this exchange that happens between our bodies and the plants around us. And it's here where we start to see the interconnectedness of this all, of how this life that we are living isn't just happening to us as an individual, but it's happening to all of us at the same time. So we learn to use the body, the weight of the body, the supportive quality of the earth beneath us and the breath. We learn to use these four things to help navigate these times that are very challenging and uncertain. So we take time and space to just come back to something reliable, something that is extremely reliable and can be done at any moment, at any time, in any place. To allow us to remember who and what we really are, to get perspective, to cultivate some real equanimity, some evenness, so that we can skillfully navigate what's in front of us and to actually be there for others that need our support. So we live from the heart, we stay with the breath, and we drop into something natural. Bring the hands to prayer in front of the heart center. May all beings find their natural rhythm. May all beings cultivate and experience a sense of joy. May all beings feel safe and secure. And may all beings drop into grace. And may all beings be free of suffering. And again, may we all take time and space to really develop an intimacy within ourselves, to be curious about this body, to start to cultivate our own intuition so we can go to another place <clears throat> for information rather than this uh, conditioned mind. Also to get to know our mind a little more closely to make sure that we're thinking in a way that is being of service to ourselves and the people around us. We stay with this practice, we go back out into our day-to-day -day lives a little more awake a little more aware, a little more mindful, and just a bit more present. So we see the wisdom that it cultivates. We see how close that wisdom is tied to compassion. We find that place within us. And we take that wisdom, we take that compassion, and we extend that out into the world in the way that we live this life. Namaste. Okay. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome, everybody. How are you all? Isolating well, I hope. <laughs> it's good to see that everyone's made it home from the last cohort. There you are, Greg. Nice to see you. Good. Um, it is our distinct pleasure to um, onto onto today's hour. Can you mute if you are if you are if you are not muted? 
Um, you guys knew each other, right? Teddy, how did you, how did you guys hook up? Stacy and I? Um, yeah. Well, of course, as almost as long as I remember, I, I have been a, uh, a fan of Stacy's. Um, I've always, uh, I started skateboarding at a very, very young age and Stacy was, uh, when I started, was pretty much already a legend in the skateboarding world at that time. And, you know, skateboarding at that time was really an outlaw sport. But I remember first um, recognizing him and, and, uh, and him skating in, you know, it was like the mid 70s, you know, maybe 76 or something when he was part of the Dogtown crew and then later with uh, GNS Skateboards. Well, cool. And, and all of that brings us to this point. Um, Stacy, can you out yourself and say something? Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, this is my first time on Zoom, so it's a whole new thing. See, we're, we're teaching you things already. We're stretching your boundaries. We're making you a better human. Yes. Well, I also, just from my perspective, I sponsored Teddy for a couple of years. He was a young amateur skateboarder, and I put him on my team. And he was a very promising skateboarder heading uh, towards becoming a professional. Um, and a v really good skateboarder. Very talented kid. Wow. There you go. We know that about Teddy. He, <laughs> he, he looks after our bodies and our minds here at the Academy. So that's cool. Um, so I think we're going to have a different type of talk today, Stacy. I think usually people kind of want to talk to you about skating. They want to talk to you about filmmaking. They want to talk to you about all the, the incredible things that you've done in your career. But literally from the first time we talked, we ended up really going in some interesting and totally different directions to everything that I'd expected. I think the most surprising thing was your, you, you almost seem to have a knack for getting to the top of your field, whatever the hell it is that you're doing, and then deciding to go and do something that you're completely unqualified to do. <laughs> yes. And making that work. And so where, where our last conversation led was around uncertainty and how you sort of create a relationship with uncertainty. And it was like, wow, that is just such a perfect topic for this time, right? It's, it's like we are in a world of deep uncertainty right now. Right. We figured we'd just riff on that and start talking and maybe you could share some of your experiences and how you've managed that. Okay. Hey, can I, right now I see myself. Can I see you guys? Is, can you switch me back? There we go. Um, first of all, I didn't expect to be successful in my life, nor did my parents expect me to be successful because the things that I chose to do were not uh, idealistic things a kid would choose. Skateboarding, surfing, they were outlaw sports like Teddy was saying, and there was no future in them. And so I grew up with the understanding that I would probably just be a tradesman. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, it's a far cry from where I ended up. And um, one of the things I've learned because I didn't get a good education is I've, I'm riddled with self-doubt. I'm riddled with uncertainty. I've never had a lot of self-confidence. And I'm not, I don't say that facetiously and I don't say it for, to get a laugh, but one of the things that I've learned in life is that there's nothing more important than desire. And my desire to do what I wanted to do was so strong that it, um, it surpassed all of the qualities that were holding me back. I wanted something. And if I could get out of bed every day and go towards it, even though my brain was saying, you have no right to do this. You have no qualifications, no education. What do you think you're doing? My brain has tried to convince me my all, pretty much my adult life that I have no idea what I'm doing and that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But I've learned that um, it's not that I have to quiet my brain. I just have to get used to the way it operates. And that's the way it operates. And what I've been, become used to is I just live with uncertainty and I live with insecurity. I don't know a lot of things. But I also don't let that hold me back from where I want to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes total sense. And, and, and let me just add this one thing. Let me add this one thing, Jeff. It's a, a lot of people ask me, they go, well, I'll, I, I'll go after what I want to go after. 
as soon as I can um, get over my self doubts, as soon as I can stop feeling so insecure, but that's like saying, well, I'll, I'll start going outdoors as soon as there's no insects. It's like, that's never going to happen. And no matter how many successful endeavors I've had in my life, they don't silence my doubts and they don't silence my insecurities. They're always there. I've just become used to living with them and knowing that they're just a part of who I am. You talk about this, this sort of soldier, your, your, this sort of relationship between the mind and the heart and, and how the mind is a soldier for the, for the desires of the heart. What, what is that, that whole construct for you? How do you sort of frame that? Well, the way I've come to realize it, and also I've thought since I didn't expect to succeed in my life and I succeeded as a professional athlete, as an entrepreneur, and as a filmmaker, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about how I got here because I wasn't supposed to get here, okay? And I also do a lot of spiritual study. I, I you know, meditate deeply every day. But one thing that I've learned is everything good comes from the heart, everything. All of our dreams come from the heart. If you look at the heart, the heart does not know how to think. The heart does not know what left or right or forward or back is, okay? The heart does not know how to procure food. The heart can't protect me from an animal that wants to kill me, nor can it help me get food from that animal. That's what the mind does. What the heart does is it tells me what I want, the dreams that come out of me. But I can't make my dreams come true without the aid of the mind, because it's the mind that takes the dream from the heart and gives it physical shape, figures out how to do it. It figures out how to build shelter or a bridge or whatever you need to get done. The heart cannot do that. And so, but the problem is, if the mind gets too powerful, it can supersede the heart and upstage it. And that's where things get dangerous because the mind is simply there as a contractor to carry out what the heart wants but it's not there to dictate to the heart. And the mind, the way it's designed, the mind thinks linearly and everything needs to make sense with the brain, okay? The heart doesn't make sense. It's not rational, makes no sense. Dreams make no sense. And so if the mind demands the dream, the heart to make sense, it's putting too much pressure on it and it will eventually extinguish those dreams based on the pressure that the mind is giving the heart. And that's why when you get a dream, you have to let it have time to gestate and develop very slowly and very carefully, and you have to keep the mind really at bay in order to give that precious little dream uh, a chance to develop on its own. It's almost like you have to look at your heart as an estuary all of the big fish are way out in the ocean, the ones that want to eat you. You have to stay in this estuary where, it's very, where you're protected. And not until that idea is developed and strong can you let it out into the greater ocean. Otherwise, it'll be extinguished. Yeah. What I, was, I, what I really loved about what you're saying, Stacey, with, with these, you know, being that you've, you've been very successful in a, in a few different fields, and I love the fact that you're still saying that, like, you're still riddled with self-doubt and you're still very self-critical. But what I hear the most, and this is what I kind of, I inter that helped myself is this, and tell me if this is true with yourself, um, getting to know yourself on a very deep level, really developing an intimacy within yourself, you know, but also keeping it open in a way to be not so sure that you totally know yourself. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. Yes. Well, I, let me, let, oh, oh. Okay with just seeing that these things don't necessarily go away, but it's how much attention do we want to give to this stuff of self-consciousness or being that like, I'm not supposed to be here. But the fact is, is that there is that desire that you're talking about and it comes from the heart. So it kind of overrides this kind of chatter that kind of keeps us down. And I think really in my own practice and what I've realized with myself is really just spending time and really right now with this, this, this uncertainty where we're all sitting confined, you know, having to look within ourselves 
is such an opportunity for all of us to finally look within ourselves and be like, you know, when we're actually let out again, how do I want to engage in this world now that I kind of, I got a little glimpse of peacefulness or understanding of how I actually am. I learned something new about myself and letting that, uh, letting that, letting that unfold once we're, once we, once we get out of, uh, you know, isolation. Well, can I address the first part of what you said? What I like about that is it's two things. It's keeping the 16 year old boy alive in myself, but it's also sinking deep into myself to understand who I am and what it is. And also realize that I'm not in control. I think my mind wants to convince me that I'm actually in control of my life and I'm not. And this doesn't mean that I wake up and just blow with the wind, but to be in control of my life means I have to surrender to humility, to my insides, which um, I got to do the best I can to silence my brain. And I got to do the best I can to find that inner compass deep in my heart. And that requires a lot of time being still, a lot of time being quiet. And a lot of um, my telling myself, I really don't know what's going on. I just have to accept and try to hear those voices when they come. So was this a relationship you always had, even since when you were a young man? Are you, a, as, as Teddy said, you're a professional skater, like the top of your field when you were 19. You then moved into business. You then moved into um, filmmaking. At each one of those steps, was this the relationship that was going on for you, or is this something you've learned? No, it's a really, I, I, I discovered early in my life, I've always been guided by intuition. And I discovered early in my life that I had an instinct for certain things. I would just, I had a very strong center and feeling about things, very strong feelings. But I was always in a battle with my brain telling me no. But those, that inner compass, those inner feelings drove me so strong that that's what I based my life around. And the older I get and the more I spend in quiet meditation, the more I sink down into that place and get to know it better. If that answers your question. Um, one, of the, one of the realities that we're all facing right now is who the hell knows what the F is going on with our heart, Stacy? You know what I mean? It's like, if I check in with my heart, it, it, I just feel like a massive bundle of anxiety. Um, how do you how do you even discern that? How do you work through that at a time like this when there's crisis, when there's stress? Well, I can only tell you what I do is I wake up in the morning and I try to meditate for an hour to two hours. Wow! Every and day. it takes but it takes a tremendous but I but don't think because I do it I just slip in and click into it. Sometimes it takes me twenty to thirty minutes to get there. Okay, to get past my to get not past the mind, but just to get away from all that chatter that just will not stop. You have to, you know the electric meters on the sides of houses with the spinning thing? That's essentially our brain. They don't stop spinning. And what you need to do is just get underneath it and it requires daily practice. And it doesn't necessarily get easier. And what's interesting, the physical life takes our attention because there's so much going on, so many bells and whistles, but our true selves are still. Imagine this, imagine Las Vegas on the right and imagine a lake, a still lake of sheet glass. Where's your attention gonna go? Is it gonna go on the sheet glass of that lake or all those bells and whistles that are constantly changing? That's what's seducing us continually, those, all the lights, but who we really are is that stillness. That's who we really are. And so that's what I, I, I work to get to that place. Because when I do touch it, it has a profound impact on my life. But it takes a lot of discipline. So you go from that stillness and you find that, that maybe it's that ease or that moment to breathe. And then what? So well, it, it tends to ground me. Or what, are you, what are you doing? So like after that? in your day what are you doing that, that you talk a lot about momentum and about creating forward motion how are you doing that you mean right now in, in the in the face of all this uncertainty or 
Just generally, I think, you know, as I said, jumping from one type of business to the other, I think there are lessons to learn from that that we can apply to what's going on right now, but maybe applying it to right now. Well, what, I, what I've always done is I've always followed my interests. Where are my interests? Okay. Well, let me ask you, let me back up a second. Okay. Let yeah. me ask you two guys something. Yeah. What is the one and only thing that belongs to you? And I'm not talking about a physical possession. What is the one and only thing that not only belongs to you, but defines who you are? What is it? Gosh. Can I, can I get help from a friend? <laughs> Teddy? Yeah, I, I don't really, you know. Okay. Can I answer it? Can, can I answer it? There's some people in the chat who are saying imagination, our mind, attention, body. Okay. Can I go back to you guys? No, back to uh, Teddy and Jeff. I think the only thing that I can think of that is this sense of awareness. Okay, bingo. Your attention, your attention, your awareness is the only thing that you can say belongs to you. It's the one thing that defines you against everybody else is your awareness, your attention. And your life is going to go the direction your, in, your attention goes. Where you put your attention is the direction that your life is going to travel. And today, our attention is under assault from so many distractions. Everybody wants our attention. Every gadget wants our attention. And that's why we have to protect it so much because it's who we are and it defines where our life goes. And so to answer your question, Jeff, what I've always done is put my attention on what my, where my interests are. And I'm a bit obsessive about my interests. I get obsessive about it and I keep my attention focused on those. And, and is that to the exclusion of other things? Because a, a lot of the time at the Academy, we talk about like how the second phase of life is about editing, right? You accumulate in the first part, half of your life and in the second half of your life, you edit. And it sounds like you're also saying with attention, it's like, I need to edit towards what's important and focus on that or focus on whatever comes from that heart place. Is that right? Or is that, are you saying something slightly different? No, that's close. Yeah. I try to put all my attention on what that dream is coming out of me wanting, because when a dream comes out, when dreams come out of us, they don't come out of us fully formed. They come out of us as an idea, as a reflection, as an impression. And it takes a lot of time to let that thing come to life. And that's a very insecure stage to be in because you're living with something that you can feel, but you cannot see. You can only follow it in a sense in a blindfolded way. And you have to be diligent to it, but you have to protect it at the same time. But you have to keep your attention focused on it. But the other part of that I wanted to say is, I'm not, so, I'm not like a Navy SEAL where I'm so dedicated to what I do that I don't have a life. I try to live a balanced life. I try to exercise, eat right, socialize properly, you know, that whole thing and, and follow other interests that I have while I'm also chasing a dream. I try not to be one of those one track people. And so right now, you're, what's fascinating about this time is we're all of us facing a high degree of uncertainty, right? And we don't know what's happening to the world. We don't know what's happening in our lives. We don't know how long we're going to be isolated for. Maybe our finances are under threat. Maybe our, you know, our family or someone's ill or something like that. How, how are you managing that kind of uncertainty? Is it exactly the same process? Is it that meditate, touch base, pay attention, and then have intention about where you're putting your attention? Or are there other things that you're doing? You talked about kind of being balanced, being physical, eating well, sleeping well. Are those parts of this discipline? Yeah, because I'm, I'm essentially, the, I'm a prisoner and I'm the warden right now. I'm in a cell block. My house has become a cell block. You know, that's what it is. And so at first it was a little, a little strange, but 
I'm trying to, you know, focus on meditating. I, I'm trying to do three forms of exercise per day. I've got a lot of books I'm reading right now. I'm also engaged in a number of projects I'm working on. So I'm just trying to wake up and be proactive, but not be too much. But, but I have to say something ironic about this whole thing that's going on right now. Everybody's so freaked out that we have to sit still for a little bit. What the heck has happened to us as human beings that we're isolated a little while and we have to be still? What's wrong with being with our families like every day? It's, it's, we've gotten so deranged in what we think is correct. Yeah. You know, it, you got to look at nature. Nature is not distracted and nature doesn't is not ambitious like we are yeah. nature just is but we always feel right now with this virus that's smaller than a bumblebee and it's completely deranged our lives because we have to sit still yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. i mean but anyways i try to be proactive in a healthy way and let me let me just close with one thought that you shared with me that, that is still kind of with me, which is like, through all the fear, through all the anxiety, once you've found what it is that you're focusing on, take a step towards it every single day, right? That's correct. So tell us about that process in, in wherever in your life that has come up. Well, every, um, every endeavor that I've done the same pattern of eccentricities have unfolded in front of me. The right. same insecurities, the same uncertainties, the same bruisings from my brain and what it says about me. And what it is, is it, I, I've learned what my process is as a person. I've learned that my brain, once I do something new, my mind is going to criticize me. It's going to tell me I can't do it. It's going to tell me that I've gone the wrong direction that I don't know what I'm doing. It's gonna say all these things because it's always said it in the past. It still does it, but I'm just used to dealing with it now. I'm, I'm used to that roommate with me the whole time that's gonna say those things. And when they, when they happen, I don't let them divert my attention because what I keep doing is try to find out what's in my gut, what's in my heart, what's that voice telling me? And that's the one I try to stay, uh, stay attuned to. And, so, and it just takes diligence. Yeah, and, 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 and there is a relationship to action that I think you're really understating, right? So it's attention, it's being obsessive and focused, and then yes. take, doing something, even if it's something that you feel is crappy, but doing something every single day to move towards your, your dream. Yeah, but also, let me say something too. There are some days where I don't want to do anything and I just lay on the couch and stare at the ceiling. So that's part of it as well. You, it, you, you can't be militant about it. It's very important that you pay attention. Sometimes you just need to cut loose and just uh, stare at a wall for three hours. It's not... It's interesting how you talk about, you know, it's almost like the way you proceed with your business endeavors and your passions is really intertwined with your, with your practice itself. And it's almost with our practice, our practice is something that we can't be overly ambitious about. Right. Well, let's, let's wrap it up, finish your thought and then I'm going to wrap up and we're going to go into groups, but yeah, finish your thought. Well, one thing I wanted to say, and I want to talk about this mind brain thing. Okay. One more time. I mean the uh, mind heart thing. The mind is very, very loud, as we all know, okay? The heart isn't. The heart is not proactive. The heart does not reach out and grab you and say, you must do this. The heart has no ambition. If you want the dream, it's there. And if you don't, there will be another one. It's just like the sun. The sun never looks down on us and says, hey, do you want light today? It just offers light every day. And it never asks us for anything in return. It just keeps giving. The heart is exactly the same way, but the only way to be in touch with the heart is to get down to its level, which is quiet, peaceful, and, hum and humility. 
that's the way to listen to it. You have to come to its, its place. And that's why meditation is so effective because it puts you, it gets you away from the mind and it lets you, allows you to drop into the heart and understand what it feels like to be there and remain there and what the heart is actually like. And that's why silence, stillness are so important. Oh man. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to, as a group, going to go into uh, just a couple of breakout groups and, and have some discussions. Um, every week we're trying to get everyone on these calls to sort of maybe share some of their thinking with the broader community. Stacey, we're going to have taken some quotes from you that we can share with the broader community as well. But, but essentially what, what we're going to want you to go and talk about is strategies to face uncertain times. How, how are you dealing with uncertainty in your life? Um, how do you plan for what's unplannable in a time that is unknowable, right? Uh, moving forwards when you don't have certainty. How do you move forwards when you don't have certainty? So in that domain, right? So strategies to face uncertain times. Um, take a couple of minutes each just to journal. We find that if people have a, a moment to just sort of think through their own ideas, it's more productive. You'll then split out into groups for about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back together for about 10 minutes with Stacy. Uh, we have two birds in this classroom. They're flying around the classroom. <laughs> an interesting metaphor to wrestle with as we do this. Um, yeah, and then we'll have 10 minutes for like last minute questions and answers. Does that sound good? Beautiful. Okay, two or three minutes to journal, and then uh, Zoe will split us out into groups and facilitate us in questions. So uh, the journaling is strategies to face uncertain times. And that's what the breakout group will be about as well. Okay. Are we isolated now? Are we off? No, no, we're, we're all still on and everyone can go out into groups in about minute and a half and then we'll be isolated <laughs> but it's all recorded Stacy so don't say anything bad about anyone <laughs> <laughs> oh darn Take about another 30 seconds just to kind of order our own thinking and then go into small groups. Maestra Zoe, make the magic happen. All right, everybody, in a moment, you're going to see a prompt to join a breakout room. Uh, Stacy, do not click the prompt. Um, that will keep you here with us. So don't press that prompt. But everyone else, please join your breakout rooms. And if you have any questions, you can um, ping me and I will be beamed up into your rooms. Um, if you would like to take notes and submit your thoughts or just have someone who's a scribe in your group who's taking down notes, if you look in the chat, there is a link to a Google form similarly to last week. So you can go ahead and just take notes and jot down ideas in there um, and then click submit after so that we will have all of your ideas. Um, thank you so much. And yep, yeah, you're going to your breakout rooms. See you in a few. In a few minutes. All right. Let's give that a moment. It was great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Stacy, I think we still have you here, so you can unmute. Shana, didn't you get a little pingy pongy thingy pongy? Pingy pongy pongy. <laughs> Sorry, I got into alliteration. I can't help myself. It's... 
all that. Hold on. Um, move to. Shana, you should be getting a new prompt. There you go. Sharon, who else do we have? Oh. Shana's back. Here, Shana. I don't know what happened. Can you send it to me again? Yes, just I got moment. lost in Cyber's world. <laughs> That's okay. I'm moving you to a room. There you go. You should get a prompt. Stacy, while you're while we're waiting, this is uh, Christine Spava. Um, you're on mute, just that so you know. So it's bottom left button. Um, Christine's uh, one of three partners here at the academy. Um, she was one of the, the founders of, of this whole program. And Stacy, we um, emailed first to get this whole thing going. Teddy made the intro, and that was you and I that were emailing, and then I asked you. To yes, yes. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. We can. Okay, okay, good. Hi there. How often do you get to do a talk where you don't have to rabbit on about skating or surfing? Or... <laughs> it's interesting, right? Oh, I love it. I mean, I do, I do talks at colleges once in a while. I do talks at corporations once in a while, and I really enjoy it. And I especially enjoy the Q&A that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. We may run a little bit over the um, allotted time, like five minutes. Is that okay with you? Totally fine. Just, I just want to check in. Sharon, Don, and Mary, if you can hear me, let me know um, if you need some help. But I don't, none of you are responding, so I think we're okay. Cool. Hi, Zoe. Hi. Hi, Christine. Welcome back. And Stacey, these are all members of our team, all distributed around the world. Um, you want to say hi, Leslie, and, and just hi. introduce yourself? Hi, Stacey. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Yeah, good to see you. You, too. you as Thank well. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. This is fun. A bunch of notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for being here with us. Oh, it's with it's us. really cool. It's really, really cool. And then we have uh, Jen. I'm Jen. <laughs> Jen and Raleigh. Oh, Raleigh. Hi, both of you. Hi, nice nice. you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Great to meet you. Heard awesome things about you. Really good hearing you talk. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank oh, you. thank you. Thank you. Are you guys in Mexico? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How this is how, they're sequestered together. So this is where we'll be doing our thing when we do our thing. Okay. Okay. And how is it down there for you guys? Is it are you guys off? I mean, are you far enough off the grid? Not really. we we all we've been we've been in lockdown and self-isolation as a group for what, three weeks? Almost three weeks. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But you are, uh, can you get food and everything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, that's great. That's great. Pretty intense, though. Even down here. It's kind of... Well, what are you guys doing to get through this time? I'm riding the hell out of my mountain bike. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Same thing spirit of our lockdown, but yeah. I'm, just, I'm just so isolated back in the desert. But yeah. yeah, and Jeff and I have been able to still surf here and there. <coughs> yeah, Eddie, do you surf a lot? Quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. Okay. I have a skateboard Cap gave me. He gave me a whole setup about four years ago while I was moving down here. I saw him in San Diego. And I just, it's, it's sitting at my friend's place in Huntington. I haven't put it together yet. Okay. It's great. Well, you know, I want to get back on it. There's actually kind of a thriving little skate scene. Yeah, there is. It's a cool little skate scene. There's a couple half pipes and a park and stuff. And it's really sweet. And they use it to sort of bring local youth away from drug culture and all sorts. There's real programming and intention around it. So it's pretty neat. It's nice. Like nice. Oh, that's great. That's super great. I try to do it one day, uh, every day for an hour. Oh, nice. Really? Still? Yeah. Wow. So you meditate for up to two hours and you skate for one hour. Yeah, and I ride my bike and I surf and I, I try to do a lot of stuff. Wow. Yeah. I mean, well, right now, all I have is time. I mean, there's just, I, I'm trying to fill 20 hours a day. 
You, you only sleep four hours a day then? Well, well you know, I, was, I, I screwed up there. Maybe my math is wrong. That's why I didn't do well in school. <laughs> no, I was, I'm always curious how many hours people get of sleep, so. I don't get that many. I don't get, I don't get enough. I, I'm not a great sleeper and I wish I was. I envy those who are. Are you someone that just cranks stuff out in the mornings and just is able to, to work? Or do you need to do your meditation and then sure. ease your- hey, I gotta ease into the morning. I don't jump into the morning. Yeah, I have to ease into it. And, and don't make this, I don't make, I'm, I'm probably making it sound like I'm super busy all the time. I'm really not. I, I don't like living a charged life. I like to, I don't, you know. You, you moved to Cayucas. You That's know. right. Best thing I've ever done. Beautiful. So, two minutes, two, three more minutes for those guys, and then we'll bring them back in. Beautiful. And Sharon showed back up. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> You're in the main room, not a breakout. Um, is that something that we could? It's okay. We're, we're bringing you. Yeah, we're yeah. almost finished. I put you into a room now. John Hutchinson. I like your background. I can't hear you. Wait, you're, you're muted. Hold on. Dawn was assigned to a room, but I think she's just not there. My background is a picture from the porch at MEA. It's <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. I recognize that. Yeah. You're, you're sitting on the fire pit. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm actually right in front of it. Oh. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, Raleigh. <laughs> questions for Stacy and also any kind of observations or any learnings as well. If you could just kind of masterclass it for everybody, that would be awesome. And then I can use like a minute. And then Christine has a minute at the very, very end. So we will aim to close out at 2.36, okay guys? Done. I can do it in less than that. I bet you can. I can name that tune. I, try, I know, I know you can. To me, um, mm -hmm. the announcement of my meditation you can do it. No, no, you do it. I'll okay. make sure you do it. Okay. Sure. Zoe, do we have anything on the forms yet? Any of the responses yet? I'm going to call them back because it uh, goes okay. to seconds, so I'll double check. But it's really, Isolation's really working for you. You're looking extra beautiful. I know, she does look really pretty. <laughs> yeah. I, think I haven't washed my hair in a week. <laughs> Uh, did, you guys hear, did you guys hear Andrew burp earlier? Yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're the one that said it. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> guys. I also think that Zoom puts all these like yummy filters on you so that you look yeah. super, super touched up. You can like filter it again. Oh no, it's about. You have to do that with the lighting. Zoom doesn't do that. Really? No, Zoom makes you look worse. So like, Stacey, you're, you, you almost look like witness protection program because you're so backlit, right? <laughs> but we can see you. That is true. That is true. Now you're going to want to be in gallery view. This is fun because everybody's popping back in. Welcome Hi, back. When's the Jerry Lopez doc coming out? We're still in editing, Teddy. It's been it's been a real bear to edit the film, but we should be done by sometime this summer. Are you are you coming down to surf with him at all in the next few months here in Baja? I don't know. I was down there a year and a half ago, and we may do some reshooting, but I don't. I'm not sure yet. I'll know in a while. No, we can definitely host you because we're closed till October. <laughs> yeah. Ish. Maybe. Are you guys? Are you guys close? To, yeah, he's on the East Cape. Jerry's on the East Cape. Yeah. You guys are on the West Side. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, we're like forty-five minutes. We're like half hour, forty-five minutes up from Cabo on the Pacific side. Okay. Welcome everyone back. I think we're all back. Yeah. So we were going to open this up for discussion and ideas, right, Jeff? Did you want to? Yeah, Zoe's going to. Oh, gonna... Zoe, sorry, Zoe. 
No, yeah, go ahead, please. If you want to share any uh, ideas from your group, please wave your hand. This is the fun like lottery where I get to scroll through. I see Susan Ordway. Hold on, I'm on, I'm on. Here we go. I got Dave. You're unmuted, Dave. Would love to hear what your group has to say. Well, I wanted to make a suggestion about network science. Uh, network science is about uh, building your network, which is a great opportunity to do right now. And you can build your network up by getting closer to the people that you know and people that you're just getting to know right now. And as you grow your network, it will become valuable to you as you come out the other end of this situation and are ready to move forward with your life and your career and things that you're passionate about. And one of the things about network science is called the strength of the weakest link. So somebody that you may have met at MEA and maybe emailed a couple of times could turn out to be the person that gives you the most beneficial advice or contact to go forward with your dream. Thank you, Dave. Stacey, if you have anything you want to jump in with, just, just feel free. You're unmuted and, and build. Or, and guys, if you have questions for Stacey, please, please ask them now. And if you don't want to ask them, feel free to throw them into chat and we'll pass them on there. Anyone else want to share? Um, Leslie. Hi, well, we sort of all agreed on the fact that the, we're modern elders, that we are probably better equipped, perhaps, than millennials are, because we have had what I call confrontations with your own mortality kind of experiences. Uh, we've dealt with a lot of different uncertainties already in life. So, so I don't know what, I mean, I think it's very individual for each person. One person in our group is really happy to be connecting with old friends and doing things like board games, uh, meditation, silence, things like that. For me, it basically kind of comes down to Baba Ramdas and be here now because there is nothing guaranteed beyond what is here right now. And it's becoming very evident and in our faces and the other thing that became evident to me is don't put off today what you think you could do tomorrow because there may not be a tomorrow you know you think you're going to have dinner with friends next week and you stay or you put it off and put it off well it's important to do the things that are in front of you when you can do them because we i think this puts us in a real um present moment so that's sort of it from our group a couple of people talked about networks and how you kind of either use network theory or you kind of call people, connect to people. A lot of what's characterized your work has just been epic networks. Talk to us about that. How have you built these networks? How do you use these connections to these incredible, whether it's athletes or business partners or film partners to, to do what you do? Wait, are you talking to me, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> Wait, you mean the networks I build you mean in, in the fields that I work within? Uh, it's just that everyone's been talking about how do, you, how do you reach out, connect to people, either in a structured way like Dave was proposing or Leslie, you know, reaching out to your family. And I think a lot of your work has always, what characterizes a lot of your work is you team up with some pretty amazing people to fulfill your, fulfill your dreams. How does that work for you? Well, the only thing I can say is I've always... Um, I've hopped a lot of fences my whole life, meaning that I've always been on the front lines of what I was interested in doing. I didn't do things from a distance. I did things face to face. And I found that by doing that, I, I had more success when I got to know everybody, when I got to know the group and when I kept myself in the group and not in an office. Like when I sponsored Teddy, I was with the kids in the field everywhere. It's not like I gave them directions from an office and said, hey, show up at this contest. And that's kind of how I, I, I've put my whole life together. I keep jumping fences. And that's the way I look at it. I don't want to, I don't want to be at a distance. I want to be upfront with everybody. No matter what my successful level is, I want to be with them. I don't want to be removed from them. I don't want the money or the success to remove me. I want to stay in it. And that's how I do it. And I, everywhere I, I've learned that I'm only as good as the team I'm a part of. The better the team, the better I am. The better the people I'm with, the better I am. The better I allow people to be, the better I am. So it's always been in that regard. That's how I build, you know, networks or teams. It's just to be one of them. 
and tried to do my best to bring out the best in everybody else. Right. Awesome. We have two more shares. Oh, sorry. Do you have? Oh, we have a visitor. Well, Stacy, this is our full partner, so Christine and Chip and myself. Hello. Hey, Chip. Um, there was a question as well for Stacy. So can we just run that and then we'll go through some more observations? Yes. Uh, so from Hamida, um, asking you, Stacy, what is your mode of meditation? What works for you when you meditate for one to two hours? Are you just being still in your mind and following your breath or is it something else? I originally learned TM when I was at, uh, about 19 years old and I practiced that for a long time. And now I'm a big follower, not a follower, but I read the books of uh, Ramana Maharshi who is an Indian sage, and I kind of follow what he suggested. Again, it's Ramana Maharshi. And again, it's, I don't follow breath. I don't, I just try to get to the stillness of my heart is ultimately what I try to do and uh, get as far away from my brain as possible. Mm -hmm. To realize eventually that the brain is just an illusion <laughs> and that there really isn't much, there's not really a, much reality to it, that the only reality is the stillness of our hearts. And that's what I meditate towards. Awesome, we're gonna get some, um, some answers from Susan. Um, I'm gonna unmute you and then we got Katie and uh, there you are, Susan, you're on, you're mute, unmuted. Okay, hi everybody. It's really great to see some faces, some uh, old and new faces. Feels like going back to MEA. Ooh. But anyway, I'll get on point here. It, our discussion between the three of us kind of broke out into three different categories. Um, sort of like a life purpose is one of the first that comes up in terms of getting you through, like refocusing on your life purpose and making sure that you're, you're feeding that and it's feeding you um, because that can be an anchor in uncertain times. Um, also, they, you know, it's coming up again and again, the community, building the community, strengthening the community, tapping into your communities of various kinds, um, and, and using that um, as, well, you all know. Um, but also then the third category is sort of like life hygiene, right? Um, you know, getting enough sleep, you know, the, the, the maintaining yourself, maintaining your mind, the meditation, uh, size, um, and you know you know back to the community so that that's kind of the three categories and i think those uh, those are three really important ones that could help that's it thank you all right and now over to katie i don't see you oh there you are oh you're unmuted go ahead okay sure um so i was in a group with mike aaron and urban um and we probably could have used another 10 minutes but anyway, uh, we all got to speak some, and we talked about trying to keep, create some sort of structure to our days, to have some aspect of nor normalcy. Um, all of us mentioned meditation and sort of trying to appreciate the stillness and just being. Um, we touch base, I mean, I called it touchstones for heart and mind daily. I'm you know, in self-quarantine with my husband, but talking to my daughter, talking to other family members, figuring out a way to do it, whether by phone or video call on it every day. Um, and let's see. Um, one other thing, our Australian friend, not, not you, Jeff, but Mike, uh, was just talking about looking for opportunities that he's in, the, in his routine He's been able to watch a lot of people, connect with a lot of people, his own networks, and, and both look for opportunities and help open opportunities for other people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sandy, we did say that we would share yours. If you could please share it in chat, we're gonna just wrap up with some questions um, for Stacy. So if anyone has, has questions, um, I think the chat's probably the easiest, but you can put your hand up if you have any questions for, for Stacy. And I'm going to pan through if anyone sees. Wendy's got her hand up. No, I think I saw one from Wendy Garfield. Okay, Wendy, if you can unmute yourself, I'm just, I don't see you. Uh, page one. 
unmuting myself as my favorite. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that I'm out of the bag. Um, I have a question for Stacy, which is, could he talk about the team? I, I get a um, sense that there's an organic process when he does find the team of how I might refer to it as falling into the team and how does that work for him? Because that seems to be a really important component to your movement. Should I start now? No. Um, what I learned at a very young age is um, I was a professional skateboarder and my dream was to create a world-class professional skateboard team. And what I learned very early is I cannot project what I want out of somebody, but I have to look at them and find out what gift that they have and do the best I can to help bring that gift out of them. And the more, the, the more I could help them develop and the more that they then developed, the more successful I became. So in a sense, I surrendered to their needs, did the best I could to nurture them, but then they made me successful. And so I've done the same thing as a filmmaker. When I work with an editor or a director of photography, I do everything I can to give them the tools that they need to be the best that they can so that I can be good. And what I find is that I dissolve myself. Yeah. And the more I can get out of the way and let them shine, the more I shine. It makes no sense. But that's how it worked. That's how it's always worked. Make them the best they can be, and I will be the best I can be. And Thank get you. my own ego out of the way. Yeah. So is there a last wrap-up question or two that we want to ask? Uh, Delph, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, um, I think you had a question. Yeah, let me read it. Um, where is my question? Oh, here it is. Okay. So Stacy, do you have examples of failures despite following desire, which you say has always kind of taken you through success after success? Yes, I have. I have so many failures. It's ridiculous. And in fact, I came to realize about 10 years ago, I was being interviewed by a magazine after I had had a film of mine fail. And the, um, the person interviewing me was saying, look, you were successful as an athlete. You've been successful as an entrepreneur. You were successful as a filmmaker. What's your secret? And it was right then that I realized the secret to my success. One of the main secrets is that I've learned how to fail. I've learned not, not only learned how to fail, but I've learned how to manage failure. And I've learned that failure never stops. See, a lot of people, when they look at my life or anybody successful, they, they only see the exclamation points. They don't see the valleys. I've had many of those, many. And I've learned how to deal with failure. I've learned how to deal with the disappointment and I've learned how to deal with what I do to myself when I fail. The self-pity that I feel, the hopelessness that I feel, and the, uh, the feeling that I'm never gonna have an idea again, that I'm done. All of these things play out every single time I do this. But now I know my process, I know this is what I do, and I know if I allow myself to go through that, I'll come out the other end, and somehow the energy will come back, and I'll start right back up again. But it's literally learning to manage it, and to understand it, and to realize that failure is a part of success. You can't succeed without failing. So it's, a, it's almost like a physics situation. You're going to fail at some things, and I continue to. It's like falling off my skateboard. I needed to learn how to crash into concrete if I was going to continue skateboarding. And that's what I did. You can't hit concrete head on. You have to learn to roll on it. And so that's what I try to learn in my life. Don't hit failures head on. Just learn to roll with them. What a wonderful place to end. Stacy. thank you so much, not only for your time, but also indulging us in a little bit of extra time. We really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, wonderful. And well done on Zoom. You, you crushed that uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Um, couple Thank of yeah. 
notes on our end list. So just, just very quickly, Telly D. Um, I'm doing another uh, live stream tomorrow, live stream guided meditation at five o'clock tomorrow. Um, you can go to teddybean.com and then go straight to my Facebook page. You're a okay. popular guy because you can't get on that, Teddy. Um, email me and uh, I'm not sure I'll help. Linda Grubbs, he'll just yeah. do a private one for you. Yeah. <laughs> and then Christine. Um, in these challenging times, I don't want us to forget. I know it's been important for me not to forget that joy is important and that without joy, there is no courage. And so along those lines, the strangest online offering that I've seen lobbed at us yet um, will be posted on our Facebook page, Mario and his gang are going to be offering online surf lessons. As wow. Wonderful as it sounds. So check our Facebook group for more information or email me if you're not on there. But um, the they're to surf the web. I'm sorry? How to surf the ocean or how to surf the web? <laughs> curriculum and it'll be Mario and his amazing team. So um, anything that we can do, of course, to support them and to boost our own joy. And, and genuinely, guys, if you could possibly log in, the beaches are empty. Though you know how those guys live hand to mouth, the surf instructors down here, and I think they'd just be thrilled to see some of your faces, um, even if it was just one time. Yeah. Anything from you, El Grand Chipper? No, no, no. My hand to mouth sounds dangerous these days. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, Leslie, anything from you? Um, just a big virtual hug to all of you uh you're amazing we are so i'm just so grateful for this community i know you all feel that way so it's good to see you all come together and hopefully we'll see you next week um our facilitator is dr keltner who is the faculty director of the greater good science center and that one remind me the title again jeff i can't it's about all or and and sort of an all in nature can help you deal with stress and build resilience in your life it's actually his whole thesis around relationship to awe and nature is frigging fascinating the brain science behind it is amazing so I'll be here same channel next week same time and um and you'll get a, a recap of this call thank you again stacy this is wonderful